We're live. Good evening. Uh, hi, I'm Marcia Wallace and I'm the uh, CAO with Prince Edward County. Um, I'm happy to have you join us tonight. Uh, tonight is a town hall. Uh, we'd really prefer to do this in person and uh, be a little bit more interactive. When I first came to the county, we did the, the one shortly after I got here on flooding uh, in the Wellington arena. And uh, that's probably the last time that we had sort of an unfettered opportunity for a bunch of people to mingle and interact. So, uh, but such is the times we're in. So uh, we're gonna do this um, electronically tonight. Uh, thank you to all those who provided comments and questions in advance. We've, um, we've uh, incorporated that and we're gonna uh, go through that. Um, first, I'm gonna just lay out a little bit about what we're here for and what we're trying to do. Tonight is an information session. There will be no decisions. Obviously, uh, you don't see any counselors uh, as part of this conversation. Um, I believe many, if not all of the counselors are watching on YouTube and uh, they get the night off. Uh, this is not for decisions. This is about information sharing and, uh, and trying to provide some context on what is a really challenging subject. Um, I think I speak for the entire management team here that we really want to be transparent about the information that we have available, the situation the county is in, and what our choices are moving forward. Um, you know, this is really what I would call the start of a conversation. Uh, we're not going to resolve anything here tonight, but hopefully we'll provide uh, the same of information that we're working from available to everyone who's interested and this will be uh, taped and then available on our website for those who don't have the time to watch it tonight who can check in later. Um, I think it's fair to say these are complex issues. Uh, when it comes to a road infrastructure, I think we can tell the difference between a road that's in good condition and a road that's in poor condition. It's a lot harder to understand the infrastructure required for water wastewater. There's a lot of things that if you're not um, part of the technical uh, conversation, whether it's uh, planning and development or the technical side of operating um, water wastewater infrastructure, or even the financial uh, uh, um, tools in terms of how we manage our, um, our, our financial situation to pay for these kinds of things, it's complex and this is one of those areas where all those things come together so it, it's not easy to understand and we're going to do our best to try and make it um, informative tonight but also uh, simple to understand I guess she'll be the judge of whether or not we meet that bar um, we're going to have a frank conversation uh, we're sharing as much as we uh, think would be helpful we have put uh, some information on uh, part of our website if you go to our website and look under the government tab, you'll see um, municipal projects and you can get to some information on where we are in terms of growth and infrastructure and financing in the water wastewater area. And as I said, it's the beginning of a conversation. It's gonna happen over the next um, several months and I, I, we'll continue to populate that uh, site with more information. Uh, certainly some of the questions we got have informed some uh, additional information we think would be useful to put up there and we'll continue to do that. So welcome your feedback on what you want to know and whether or not we're kind of meeting that bar. Um, the other th reason we're having this conversation, kind of the why now, is because there is a number of really uh, complex uh, decisions coming before council over the next few weeks and months. And uh, this is to provide some context both to council and to the community at large. Uh, in terms of um, uh, what, what is framing the recommendations that staff are gonna bring in front. So, so that's a big part of it. Um, in terms of logistics for tonight, uh, we have coordinated the questions in advance. Um, so thank you very much for those who provided some. We actually got quite a number of questions and we'll do our best to go through as much of that as possible tonight. Um, the questions also informed some of the slides you're going to see in the presentation and some of the commentary that the directors are going to share with you. Uh, when we knew what people were interested in, we made sure that we were trying to uh, cover the, as much of that as possible. So some of your questions we hope will get answered in the actual presentation. Um, the presentation is broken into three parts. Um, and uh, perhaps, Clerk, uh, we can have you uh, screen the presentation now. Um, and I'll do some introductions. Thank you. Just 
just wait for Chad to get this organized. Great. So um, uh, obviously we know the topic. Let's just jump to the next slide. Uh, the presentation is broken into three parts, and I know my uh, directors, fellow directors are really uh, not happy with me for putting these pictures up, but um, uh, what we are going to do is the first part is going to be carried by Peter Moyer, who is an engineer and our director of development services. He's going to speak to the growth part of this question and, and where the impetus for uh, growth and development is coming from and, and what our information is in that context. Don Kaza is our Director of Water and Wastewater Services, uh, uh, really the operational expert in terms of how we run the, the plants and systems that we have. And he's gonna walk through um, the operational side and how that relates to our current capital plan. And then finally, the third part will be led by Amanda Carter, our Director of Finance, who will talk about our financial tools that are available to the municipality and how in particular uh, we are, intend to uh, propose using some of those tools and, um, and, and how that um, moves us forward in terms of what we will be bringing to council. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the presentation uh, over to Peter. Once uh, all three of them are finished, then uh, I'm going to, um, resume and we will go through the questions based on uh, the feedback we got from those of you who wrote to us in advance. So uh, thanks very much for joining in and uh, I'll turn it over to Peter, thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna start off talking about the county's growth principles. Uh, so one of them is we must meet provincial regulatory requirements and how we operate. So growth is managed through the official plan and or secondary plan as the case may be. And through the plan lands identified for certain purposes and settlement areas are defined to accommodate growth. So while council approves the plans, the province gives final approval on the plan. On the water wastewater side, there are regulatory requirements for quality, quantity, capacity and utilization. And Director Don Caza will elaborate a little bit more on this on his uh, section of the presentation. Another growth principle is maintain infrastructure in good condition. So municipalities must maintain water and wastewater infrastructure under strict parameters of the MECP, uh, such that quality standards can be achieved. MECP is Ministry of Environment um, for our purposes. Um, another principle is invest in a wide range of infrastructure to support the needs of businesses and residents. So relatively speaking, the county is a big place. It's widespread with differing needs, depending on the location. Rural areas road infrastructure, while the need in urban areas can more towards water and wastewater. Another principle is ensure infrastructure investment is spread fairly across the county. In urban areas where population is more dense, growth is encouraged to focus infrastructure within the defined settlement areas to help offset the high costs of building and maintaining the infrastructure. The settlement areas are connected by rural areas and investment in roads infrastructure needs to continue. Of note, that water wastewater infrastructure is supported by rates, which is not tax-based, unlike roads. However, growth should pay for itself. And this is the way we approach growth-related costs through development charges, connection charges, and other contribution agreements to offset the costs associated with specific growth-related items. So we have seen some growth in the last, yeah, next, next slide, yep, yeah, good. We have seen some growth in the last little while. Uh, and I'm sure everyone who uh, is watching this has seen the impact on real estate. So even five years ago, majority of the homes sold in the county uh, for less than $300,000. And now less than 15% of the homes sold sell for less than $300,000. And in 2020, the average selling price is $540,000. Meanwhile, the average household income is still less than $61,000. The number of home sales in 2020 was nearly 40% higher than what they were in 2019. And this demand has left the housing inventory at an eighth of normal levels. So just looking at residential permits over the last five years, we can see that in 2015, we had about hundred units. We've had a significant increase since 2015, but since about 2017, it's been a fairly consistent number of new homes each year. And as expected uh, with those new homes coming online, the population has uh, increased over that same time period. Looking at the projected growth now, uh, we see 2021 to be much in the same vein as the last few years. 
But with the number of development applications currently being approved, we anticipate seeing substantial increases starting in 2022 and consistent growth over the next five years. Staff feel reasonably confident that the interest shown by developers is real since many are undertaking pre-servicing agreements, which requires a large investment of cash without the guarantee of final approval, which shows us they're serious about getting into the ground. In Willington, there's a will that enter into front-ending agreements, again, something that they wouldn't do unless they were serious about moving forward. So looking at Wellington specifically here, we, we had, we're anticipating over 200 new starts per year starting in 2022 over the next few years. And once the plants are in place, the developers want to increase the starts over 300 per year. As mentioned in the last slide, there's reasonable amount of confidence that developers are serious about building the number of units indicated due to their willingness to front end growth related costs. So with that, I'll pass it on to Don Casa, who will speak about the county's water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm gonna try to talk a little slower and uh, um, probably gonna speak a little bit about this slide uh, a little more than just what it looks like. Um, Generally, uh, this gives everybody that's watching a pretty good idea of how spread out we are in terms of water and wastewater uh, facilities in the county. And obviously that leads to some challenges. Um, we have to figure out ways for our staff to, uh, from an optimization perspective, um, work in various locations without having to drive all the way across the county. So um, what we do is uh, we, we station people in Picton and in Wellington and in Amelia'sburg on the water side and we station set operators up in Picton and Wellington uh, in terms of our wastewater systems. Uh, this allows for us to uh, kind of divide our, uh, our, our uh, county map up into what we call the north, which would be Amelia'sburg, Rossmore and Peets Point, uh, the west, which is Wellington, Consecon and Carrying Place, and then Picton uh, system. And uh, that way we, we uh, do our best to uh, maximize the use of our vehicles and uh, staff time. Um, but as everyone can, I'm sure can imagine, many municipalities only have one water and wastewater treatment plant, whereas we have, uh, we have six water treatment plant, well, six drinking water systems. Four of those are actual water treatment plants. And on the wastewater side, we have two wastewater treatment plants. Um, when it comes to operating a water and wastewater treatment plant, generally, um, they all have the same legislative requirements. Uh, the same amount of documentation has to be done. The, uh, the, the time that it takes to uh, sample and send that, those samples away for analysis. Um, and the time that the ministry uh, is involved with ministry inspections of these facilities is uh, significant. So it, it really puts a, a lot of burden on our staff and our, our compliance people to uh, to manage all of these different systems that are spread across a, a good chunk of the county. Um, moving over to the uh, uh, another significant uh, challenge, sorry, not ready yet, uh, Chad, uh, thank you. Um, you'll, you'll notice that there's a little table off to the side that says uh, number of connections and number of units. In terms of the number of connections, that would be the number of service lines that actually run into uh, res res residences, uh, commercial buildings. Um, so if you compared us with say another municipality, um, we have a very limited number of users that uh, pay into our system. And that's one of the reasons that, that our rates are higher um, compared to other municipalities that might have a larger user base uh, to pay into the system. If I look at the table and compare connections to units, the reason there's a difference there is because units would, um, be slightly different than service connections because it, an apartment building, for example, would have uh, more units. And that's why we would see a, a difference there. You also notice uh, when we look at drinking water versus wastewater, uh, we have some systems in the county that obviously don't have wastewater. So that's why you would see a, a reduction in number of service connections there. Um, I think um, just looking down my list, um, I get one other aspect and Peter Moore touched base on this. A lot of people don't realize that uh, when you pay your taxes, uh, you don't pay anything towards water and wastewater. Water and wastewater is a completely user pay system. 
Uh, that's the way that uh, it's set up with the ministry. Um, and uh, so generally, um, um, a lot of people don't understand that. So I thought I would just uh, speak to that a little bit. Um, really all it's all that contributes to water and wastewater is the bills uh, that we get from our customers, um, the revenue we get from our customers. Let me go to the next slide. So this is just a, a, a map of the Picton uh, system. Um, it's hard to see from a two-dimensional type of map, but Picton's actually quite an interesting uh, distribution and collection system. Um, on the water side, uh, we have quite a lot of elevation difference across the, the, the distribution system. So um, in low areas, we can have pressures as high as uh, 80 PSI and in uh, the higher elevation areas, um, 30 to 40 PSI at times. Um, so it makes it uh, quite challenging to operate, um, but our reservoir sits up on uh, the top of the um, kind of like Champlain's lookout. Um, and uh, it provides uh, the plant fills the reservoir, the plant shuts off and the reservoir feeds down. And it's also quite interesting to know that the reservoir in Picton will actually fill the water tower in Bloomfield uh, without any pumps involved. Uh, when you get to the Bloomfield system, which is part of the Picton distribution system, there is a chamber there that uh, has a special valve in it that opens and closes to fill the Bloomfield tower. Um, Something also interesting in Picton, and uh, it's tied to rates, um, but it's interesting people may not know, but over the last 15 years or so, we've rebuilt uh, approximately 20 streets in Picton. And uh, I like to think that that's quite a proactive uh, move by, by uh, council and, and staff. Um, it has contributed, contributed to higher rates, but um, by proactively rebuilding streets, we have got a, uh, removed a lot of old infrastructure that's in the ground, old cast iron water main. Um, we, our number of water main breaks have decreased uh, significantly and uh, it allows us to have uh, a better control of our system with, with uh, less water loss. Um, in terms of next steps, we, uh, we have some other streets uh, that are going to be part of uh, uh, the next couple of years. Um, Elk Street, Picton Main Street, likely, uh, between Bridge and Spencer, and uh, work out towards Highway 49. Uh, next slide. Um, we can move, to, that's just a photograph of the Picton uh, water treatment plant from, from the water. Um, we can move to the next slide. So generally, uh, each one of our facilities, we have a slide like this that's going to kind of go over uh, some of the basic information about it. Um, Picton generally is our, our largest facility, uh, but it's also our oldest. You'll see from its year of construction, um, it's had various upgrades over the years, but it's uh, it's quite an old plant. Uh, uh, you know, there's parts of it that are 90 plus years old. Um, it's built on a kind of like a, a, a filled in section of the Picton Bay. Um, and uh, um, portions of it are, are showing their age. Uh, that's why uh, currently on the on the 20 year capital plan, it's looking like uh, there's about 10 years of life left and it's uh, it's uh, currently on there for potential replacement in 2030. Um, you'll see it's rated capacity um, is fairly significant for the location and it's it does definitely have uh, can can pump more water out. It's more the age of the facility that uh, is showing showing the challenges. And as water treatment plants get older, they tend to require more uh, maintenance. And uh, you know, you, you get to a point, it's very similar to a used type of vehicle. The longer you keep it, the more it costs to maintain. And uh, eventually the, the, they become less dependable and more of a risk. Uh, one other highlight for Picton is uh, Picton Bay is quite a, a source, a raw water source that has many risks. Uh, it's a very shallow intake. Uh, that's the pipe that feeds into the, the actual facility. And it uh, has a number of risks, things like blue-green algae and um, potential for fuel spills and um, a number of other uh, source water threats. Um, we can move to the next slide. Uh, this is an aerial view of the Picton wastewater plant. Uh, 
It was uh, the Picton Wastewater Plant was constructed in 2011, and this is prior to it actually uh, being commissioned. Um, it's uh, uh, our newest facility. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, our newest facility uh, has a rated capacity of uh, 6,000 cubic meters a day. And uh, it, that, this facility has the ability, and, and I, I would say that uh, um, in part of its design, uh, there was consideration for, for growth. Uh, there are components of it that can be expanded, and there are other aspects that would have to be uh, added on in terms of upgrades. But um, generally, uh, the wastewater system continues to uh, grow. Uh, we, as we expand and have further growth in Picton, there will be additional wastewater pump stations. You can see that uh, there are quite a number of them. Generally, all the pump stations in town all feed into one main pump station. Uh, that's the Layler Street pump station, which is down in Delhi Park, where the old wastewater treatment plant used to be. That particular uh, pump station is, uh, has very large pumps in it, and uh, it's very unusual for a wastewater treatment plant uh, in 2000. I guess in the early 2000s to 2011, when they were considering replacing this facility, uh, very difficult to find uh, land in a low lying area. The, uh, so the choice was made to actually pump our wastewater up to the, the new plant, which sits quite high in elevation. And then the wastewater drains by gravity uh, back down to uh, an outfall, which is, uh, uh, feeds into Marsh Creek. Um, next slide. Uh, this is just a general overview of the current uh, Wellington water and wastewater uh, distribution and collection system. You can see the uh, locations on there of the pump stations, the two treatment plants, and the existing water tower. Um, the, the existing uh, water treatment plant was built to, in the late 90s. Uh, the wastewater plant uh, back in the 60s, uh, the pump stations in the 60s, and the water tower um, was from the original uh, water treatment plant, which was actually a well station that was on Beach Street. So the water tower is, in, is uh, quite uh, an old piece of infrastructure. Um, we can move to the next slide. Uh, you'll see that uh, something I, I'm um, different about the Wellington drinking water system is that you'll see its treatment overview. It's a direct filtration plant. And what that means is that the raw water, uh, the source water that supplies this water treatment plant, which is Lake Ontario, is quite a clear, clean source water. So direct filtration means there's uh, no sedimentation tank in the treatment process. So the, the water, once uh, it comes in and a coagulant is added, it uh, directly uh, goes on top of the filters and uh, it skips the sedimentation stage, which would normally be used when you had much more murky, turbid water. Um, so Wellington is very fortunate there. The source is a very good sort of water source. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, moving through the treatment side, um, the plant was built um, you know, 25 years ago, the, the current plant. And when it was built, the, the flows were uh, a lot lower. Uh, there are two treatment trains, two filters basically inside the water treatment plant. Uh, they're aging, and the challenge now is, as the plant starts to uh, uh, produce more flow, uh, as we get closer, more people and more service connections, the, uh, the, in order to do maintenance on the filters, uh, we end up having to take one offline, and, it, it, uh, and these filters to take offline for any repainting or work can be off for significant periods of time, a month or two. And if they're offline, we're forced, uh, we only have one filter. So there's, uh, there's some limitations there. Um, another quick update about this particular plant is that the water treatment itself was built to fill the tower. And the tower is, is generally the, the supply for the town in terms of pressure and, and fire protection. Um, yeah, so that's generally, uh, People, some people may think that the plant itself can pressurize uh, uh, and provide the town with flow. That's not really how it was designed. Next slide. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, uh, you know, dates back uh, quite early. Um, 
it's actually uh, experiences some significant uh, challenges in the springtime or any wet weather events. Uh, we have many months at a time in wet years where we run at rated capacity. Uh, it's an extended aeration plant, which is uh, common for, for uh, treatment facilities of this size. Actually, Picton is an extended aeration plant. And then all that means is that inside the wastewater uh, uh, process, as the raw wastewater comes in, it goes into a large aerated tank called an aeration tank. And inside that aeration tank is where all the microorganisms uh, live and grow to help uh, uh, treat the actual wastewater. Um, I think that's generally um, just looking at my notes. Yep, that's all. Uh, one more thing, this plant is uh, quite old. It doesn't have any automation. Uh, pretty much staff have to visually uh, monitor and, and, and hands-on type of approach to, uh, to work this system. Uh, the latest upgrade for this site uh, would have been the addition of the biosol storage tanks that are at the site. And that would have been in the 90s that those were constructed. Next slide. Uh, Rossmore Fenwood system. This one is a, a strictly a distribution system. We do have a chamber uh, that has a flow meter and uh, um, some simple equipment for monitoring pressure um, that's right on our side of the bay. Uh, the pipe comes from Belleville. It tees off of their main supply to this actual city of Belleville. You can see the uh, water taking amount. Um, generally, there's some uh, room uh, in terms of our our daily flows, uh, typically we range between 300 and 350 cubic meters a day at the current times. Uh, the challenge here is in the past, the water that we purchased from Belleville uh, has been fairly expensive. Um, generally, uh, um, some of the challenges in terms of capital infrastructure for this site and, and time, um, the water mains are fairly old. Uh, we do find on, on the section that runs out to Fenwood Gardens that we have a number of services that are uh, plastic, uh, service saddles that seem to have experienced some corrosion from the soil. So annually, we do see a number of uh, service connections along there that have to be excavated and uh, repaired. Um, next slide. Carrying place, we, we get water across the bay from uh, Quinney West. Uh, there's a large uh, um, pipe that uh, connects onto Portage Bay Road. And uh, there's a small meter chamber there. Uh, Consequently, carrying place is a little bit um, um, more complex system. It actually has two different pressure zones. So the carrying place area uh, runs on Quinney West water pressure. Uh, there's a booster station in carrying place that pumps water to fill the Consecon Tower, and that uh, fills as the tower calls for water. There's uh, telemetry inside the tower that tells us its elevation, and when it gets to a lower level, the, there are pumps that come on in the carrying place booster station that fill that tower. Um, water taking in uh, Quinny, from, from this system is uh, similar to what we see in Rossmore Fenwood. Um, Amelisburg, uh, the water source is Roblin Lake. Uh, very few service connections, uh, 62 uh, on this system. This uh, particular facility doesn't have um, water storage and there's no fire protection in this, uh, in this system. There generally are pumps inside this facility that run through uh, a package type plant. There's actually two different filter trains and the, uh, the low lift pumps, the pumps actually push the water through the filters and the pumps run continuously. So anytime these pumps were to shut off, we would technically see uh, lower pressure in the system. And uh, um, so all of these systems, uh, um, staff are on call for these systems 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, every facility is alarmed. So um, our on-call person could get called to any one of our water treatment facilities. Uh, next slide. Uh, Pete's Point, uh, even a smaller system. Um, but I have to say that our two, our two smaller systems, um, the challenge with smaller drinking water systems is that 
operating conditions can change much more rapidly than in larger facilities. You uh, have to be able to respond a lot quicker and changes can happen uh, faster. So um, there have been a number of uh, optimizations that have been done at these two facilities and generally our number of callouts have uh, decreased significantly uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, Pete's point, you'll see uh, its source water is a goody well. That means it's a well that's under the direct influence of surface water, which means that uh, the treatment system inside the building uh, has to be fairly significant. It has to have uh, cartridge filtration. It has UV treatment, and it also has chlorination as a secondary disinfection. Um, next slide. Um, so this is a, a general um, overview kind of estimate of what we're looking at um, for the next 20 years uh, for our capital plan uh, for water and wastewater. Um, so if we move down the list from the top, you'll see the Picton, water, drink, the Picton drinking water system, um, um, quite a high investment there. And that's because in uh, 10 years, uh, there's um, um, money on the plan for the replacement of the water treatment plant. If that were to occur, there could be other options, uh, but that's why that number, it's construction of a potentially new water treatment plant and a new intake. Uh, the Picton wastewater system, uh, wastewater plant, uh, generally you'll see that there are things like new aeration blowers, SCADA programming, network upgrades, UV equipment, and every water or wastewater treatment plant has a type of control document. And in that control document, which could be a C of, they're not called C of A's anymore, ECA's on the wastewater side and permit and licenses on the water side, um, triggers water and wastewater um, departments to come up with long-term capital planning. Uh, you have to allocate operations budgets to ensure that you have the funds to operate and maintain and uh, adequately staff facilities. So um, what we see here is the long range capital planning aspect of that. And yeah, so our, um, these items that you see uh, uh, listed as a description of needs are some of the items that are on our 20 year capital plan, just highlights basically. Um, and the dollars are estimated dollars based on the time that the plan is uh, actually produced, uh, obviously. As you move through the years, uh, those, those costs could increase depending on uh, various factors. Um, you'll see that we moved to Wellington water and wastewater plants. On this scenario, these are the costs that we would see in a non-growth uh, option in Wellington. So even if we were to grow in Wellington, these are the costs that would be triggered based off operating, maintaining and upgrade the existing sites. Um, whereas the Picton systems and the others are, are based off, off the actual uh, plan. Um, obviously growth could change. Uh, there, there would be a different scenario with growth, but uh, you'll see there's still significant expense um, on the water side. We could see, we would need to see significant changes in terms of uh, filters and upgrades, uh, SCADA programming, high lift pumps, uh, filter media replacement, building and roof repairs. And when you look across the, this scenario over 20 years, those are the costs that uh, are identified. On the wastewater side, uh, eight and a half million. As I mentioned earlier, the Wellington wastewater plant has, has uh, experienced significant challenges with uh, wet weather flows that produce, that push us beyond rated capacity. And uh, beyond rated capacity in wastewater is a challenge because you can actually wash out your plants and your microorganisms causing us not to meet our regulated uh, compliance limits and uh, end up putting us into a poor position with the ministry with reportable events. Um, if we move to Rossmore Fenwood, um, there, the system itself doesn't have as much infrastructure, mostly pipes in the ground, but you'll see the most expensive item there over the next 20 years is uh, some, some replacement of water services along the County Road 28 and Fenwood Gardens portion of that uh, drinking water system. The other components are part of the actual metering chamber that's on our side of the bay. Consequent carrying place, uh, slightly more expensive. Uh, that has a uh, obviously a, a booster station that has a standby generator and those uh, can be quite expensive. Their typical lifespan 
uh, dependable lifespans of 20 years. So this will be uh, coming up during this 20 year cycle. And you'll see programming, network upgrades, uh, booster pumps, instrumentation, and the water tower painting is something else that comes up. Uh, they were just done recently. They tend to be on a 10 year cycle. And if you keep up that 10 year cycle, you can keep the costs uh, to, uh, you know, uh, expected costs, which range from 200 to 300,000. If you uh, push past your 10 year cycle and you end up with a lot of corrosion, you can end up with significant costs. Um, so you want to be proactive with your painting of your water towers. The Ameliorsburg system, um, due to its age and the of, of its current and existing filters, the largest portion of the cost over the next 20 years for there are the generator replacement and replacing the filter trains themselves. Uh, they'll be at end of useful life over the next 20 years. And Pete's Point, um, once again, generator. The biggest cost in Pete's Point is the actual water main loop. Um, it uh, is a, a very poor quality PVC pipe and uh, it, it will be at its end of a useful life uh, during the next 20 years. Um, so that's uh, pretty much the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, pass it along to uh, uh, Amanda Carter. Amanda, you're on mute. Good evening, everyone. Um, to premise the financial tools discussion, I just want to explain that the county has um, two separate um, budgets that we maintain. We maintain an operating budget and a capital budget for tax supported services and an operating budget and a capital budget for the water wastewater services or rate supported services. Um, as the slide indicates here, uh, reserves and reserve funds are for a um, save now for future payment situation. So to convert this um, to everyday life, think of reserves as a way of saving for a future vacation. Every payday you're setting aside money for that vacation you're gonna take in three years or four years. Um, that's how reserves work in a municipal environment. We're setting funds aside for future capital purposes. Reserves are funded through either the tax levy or the water wastewater rates. Uh, the majority of the county's tax supported capital budget is paid for through reserves and reserve funds. And we have capital plans that are tied to those reserves and reserve funds. Uh, however, with respect to water wastewater services, the county has very little in water and wastewater reserves and reserve funds that could be used to finance the current capital budget or capital requirements uh, for uh, the current capital or even the capital forecast or for the years 2022 to 2025. Uh, the current water and wastewater rates study uh, or plan has the county building its uh, water and wastewater reserves for future capital requirements and the current capital is being financed from debt. Um, that is how the previous rate study uh, saw us paying for capital um, and had us building reserves for future capital um, down, the low, down the line. Um, and that will have to continue in the next rate study as reserves are still quite low. Uh, user fees under the Municipal Act are seen in the county's tax supported budget with a variety, wide variety um, of fees. Some example of these fees are burn permit fees, ice rental rates, ball diamond rentals, bag tag fees, building permit fees and planning fees, to name a few. Uh, these fees are, uh, and charges are usually updated and adopted annually through the fees and charges uh, bylaw update. Uh, and user fees help to defray the impact to the tax levy. With respect to water and wastewater services, these fees translate to water and wastewater fees for the monthly base charges and consumptive rates. Uh, in addition to these operating uh, fees, there are also capital connection charges. Development charges are fees that the municipality places onto developers and builders to pay for the future capital costs as a result of the development and building. These charges support the capital's principle of growth pays for growth. At this time, the county has a DC background study that covers things like roads, transportation services, fire protection, 
Parks and Recreation, Marinas and Harbors, Municipal Parking, Libraries, Administration or Studies, Waste Diversion, and Long-Term Care. Uh, our current DC background study does not include water and wastewater. So undertaking uh, right now, the county is, has undertook the work um, with our consultant Watson and Associates to bring forward a development charges background study that is area specific to Wellington for water and wastewater charges. Um, the adoption of such will allow the municipality to enter into front ending agreements under the Development Charges Act, once a background study for DCs is adopted, a municipality may enter into front ending agreements, which will allow the municipality to collect development charges up front, rather than at the time of the building permit issuance. Uh, development charges are a way to ensure that growth pays for growth. Long term debt is the county's use of loans to help pay for major capital infrastructure. Uh, the municipality has historically used the province to obtain debt financing as the lending rates are lower and amortization periods can be matched to the life of the capital infrastructure uh, that the banks cannot compete with or provide. This next chart um, is an estimation of what um, the impact of growth countywide will have on property tax revenues and wastewater revenues. Um, growth means that there will be a larger base to share these costs or capital costs. For example, if you have costs of $1,000 and you only have 10 people contributing towards these costs, that's $100 per person. But if you were to able to get 20 people to share those costs, that would reduce it down to $50 a person to contribute towards that. It lowers the amount that each individual would contribute. So it defrays the cost out more over more people. Uh, there is no difference for municipalities and our costs. Uh, the more ratepayers we have uh, to contribute means that the total costs are distributed amongst those ratepayers. Um, and for use of that slide, um, for those uh, that are listening in to us this evening, um, to estimate these uh, property tax revenues, the current 2021 residential tax rate was used and the current 2021 water and wastewater rates were used. So the tax rate for residential for 2021 is um, decimal 0090902. And for water rates, our base charge is currently 32.29, and consumptive rates are 2.79 per cubic meter. Uh, the 2021 wastewater rates, the base charge is $43.84, and the consumptive rate is $3.58. Of note, sorry, I'm still on that slide. Of note, the average residential assessment per MPAC is $258,210. This, and this is what was used to estimate the future um, tax growth um, of 9.6 million. So if the average selling price of, the, of our housing is approximately 540,000, and it was used to estimate the future tax payments, that would equate to an additional 20 million using today's tax rates. Um, so the message I'm trying to convey is that the figures are lower than what the county will actually receive with growth as houses are assessed. Next slide. Uh, this slide illustrates uh, fast how growth pays for growth and how that impacts the water and wastewater rates. If the municipality did not anticipate any growth in Wellington, it would have to undertake 18 million in debt, which would directly impact the water and wastewater rates. Uh, for those wishing to tie this figure back through the presentation, the two projects are listed on slide 21 as 9.8 million and 8.5 million that uh, Director Kaza spoke to um, just a few moments ago. Uh, with the anticipated growth, the capital costs required are 68 million over the next five to six years. However, 52 million can be serviced or paid for by development charges and 16 million would impact the rates. The debt impact to the municipality decreases as the cost can be funded by the development charges. The Wellington um, 
servicing master plan will also be influenced by construction loans in the first couple of years, uh, which reduces the impact to the municipality to just the interest charges while construction is going on. Once the projects are complete, the construction loans will be converted to a long-term debenture, which will have higher payments that include both principal portion and the interest portion. Um, and I do believe that the current rate uh, per Infrastructure Ontario is around 0.65% for a construction loan. By adopting the area-specific development charge, the municipality can ensure that growth pays for growth. The bottom of this chart was calculated using the same premise as the previous slide that um, showed or illustrated countywide the impact of growth on our um, property taxes and on our water wastewater rate revenue. Uh, for this slide, we have taken and restricted um, those numbers just to what would be collected uh, for Wellington. So collecting more taxes allows the municipality to finance other infrastructure needs for, uh, such as roads, bridges, um, culverts, uh, other uh, areas or tax supported services. Next slide. So upfront financing agreements, uh, these are allowed under the Development Charges Act. Um, the upfronting financing agreements allow the county to collect development charges before costs are ever incurred, can be used to either pay for costs as they are incurred, or we can use them to pay debt charges. Developers pay for growth and pay early rather than paying the development charges when the house is connected um, or when building permit is issued. So we get the money up front. Um, letters of credit are part of an upfront financing agreement um, that the county is looking to enter into with certain developers. For those that do not know what a letter of credit is, they are letters issued by the bank naming the municipality as a beneficiary, and they serve as a guarantee for payments made to the municipality under specified conditions. It's basically a loan held in paper until the funds are drawn upon. If the funds are never drawn, the letter, of, the letter of credit remains at full value. For example, if you have an available lending threshold with the bank of $200,000 and you need to issue a letter of credit for $100,000, the letter of credit will reduce the amount of available credit to $100,000 as the letter of credit commits the other, the other $100,000. Um, the letter of credit are being used to ensure that the municipality receive receives payment for the uh, development charges up front and to mitigate our risk. Next slide. Um, these upfront financing agreements also allow for staff to plan and understand what is projected and what's coming online and when, um, and it helps the county in maintaining a positive cash flow. Um, mitigates our impact of debt charges or other developer costs from impacting water and sewer rates. So in this uh, instance, for example, if the project costs are a million dollars, but the development charges calculation indicates that 25% is benefit to existing residents and 75% is related to the growth, then the 750,000 will not impact the water and sewer rates. Only the 250,000 would be used in the calculation of the water and wastewater rates. Um, I would like to let everyone know that that type of agreement is just for the timing of the payments of the development charges. Uh, previous slide. Uh, development charges are normally paid at the time of the building permit issuance. Uh, the front end agreement allows us to deviate from that and collect development charges at the time specified in the front ending agreement. In exchange for the upfront payment of DCs, the developers receive a guarantee that they get to connect at a certain time. This agreement does not lay out the capital construction requirements, nor does it allow the developers to influence the type of infrastructure constructed. Those details remain with the municipality and council to decide. Next slide. As our CAO indicated at the beginning of this presentation this evening, this is just the beginning of this conversation. It's very complex, and we're trying to break down the conversation into step-by-step -step pieces so that everyone can follow what is happening and at what time. The next step is the finalizing of the DC background study for Wellington Water and Wastewater, and this will come to the Committee of the Whole on April 29th. 
Um, as you can see from there, we'll be looking to finalize um, the uh, financing agreements or the upfront financing agreements with council. And from there, we'll move to the water rate study. Um, and then we will be consulting with the public on consultation on our rate scenarios. Uh, from there, we will uh, move into the fall and to adopting our proposed water and wastewater rates after that consultation has taken place. Um, and for those of you at home that, that don't realize this, our current rate study is only in effect until December 31st, 2021. So at this time, uh, that is why the rate study is being undertaken is to ensure that we have uh, water rates moving into the future. Thank you. Okay, clerk, can I ask you to uh, unshare your screen and go back to the view with all of us? And if I can ask the directors to turn their cameras back on. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Peter, Don, and Amanda. Um, what we're gonna do next is uh, we got a lot of questions and um, some of them uh, were, uh, complicated. And so I'm going to try to do my best to pull out some of the things that uh, I think we need to delve in more based on this presentation and what people were interested in. Uh, just a couple of reminders, if you've joined part way, uh, you can find this uh, taped presentation will be available on our website, um, uh, I think tomorrow, but this week, you'll be able to find this to review it or, or share with others if you're interested. That will also be where you can find the slides that were uh, discussed tonight. So you'll be able to see them, uh, all the slides and revisit some of those statistics and information that was outlaid. Um, we're also, uh, you can find this on our website in the government section. So if you go to the, the top scroll bar and go to government and you'll find municipal projects and follow it from there and you should be able to find it. Uh, we're also going to be putting up uh, some frequently asked questions based on uh, the questions we saw um, uh, that you were interested in and we can build on that over time. As Amanda said, this is the beginning of a number of different pieces. And so we'll continue to build up questions and add more information uh, as we find um, it useful to people who are trying to navigate. We don't wanna drown you in information, um, but also wanna make sure that the community and, and the council have what they need to, uh, to evaluate and understand the decisions coming before council. So I'm going to uh, try to uh, start, kick off some of these questions. I'm gonna start with you, Peter. Um, a number of people were interested in the growth projections that you identified in the early part of this presentation. And you showed a marked increase uh, starting um, in the next five years compared to the last five years. Can you just speak to why, uh, why you think that growth is actually gonna happen? Well, Marcia, as um, was mentioned during the presentation, we're experiencing interest in development in the county like we've not seen in the past. And that level of commitment from the developers, um, they're willing to commit into pre-servicing agreements. And I know most people probably don't know what that is, but a pre-servicing agreement allows the developer to install infrastructure at their cost um, without any commitment from the municipality. So they get draft plan approval. Um, Sometimes developers will achieve draft plan approval and then the plan just sits and nothing happens. Everyone thinks something's gonna happen, but sometimes it doesn't. What, what we're seeing here is they're getting draft plan approval and they immediately wanna jump into pre-servicing, which, which is a true tell that they're willing to put their money without getting final approval. They don't have a subdivision agreement yet. They still have a lot of things to cover but they're putting it in at their risk. Um, that gives us an indication that they're serious about doing this and uh, the number of units that they want. Obviously the market um, has a factor in all of this, but they're confident that the market for Prince Edward County is there. They're willing to put their own dollars in the ground without any final commitment from the county. And that's a really good indicator for us that uh, that the growth is going to happen. Um, 
obviously yeah, and- we can't, we don't have a crystal ball. Uh, we don't know what the market's going to do. We don't know what the, the effect of COVID is going to have in this long term, uh, how people will behave. But the indications are right now that that the the interest is there and we feel that the, based on what we know today that the growth is actually there. Yeah, I would agree, Peter. And I think that I would add that uh, we're seeing that uh, not just in Picton or Wellington, you're seeing that in those, that willingness to do the upfront servicing at their expense. You're seeing that in, in, in some of the communities like Rossmore, up near Consigon. So you're seeing it uh, more widespread. And, and certainly when I look at other municipalities, there's, uh, there is a development um, increase that, you know, I think probably wasn't predicted 10 years ago. Um, I think everyone keeps telling me this community is very different than it was uh, five years, 10 years, 15 years ago. And you certainly see that, uh, you know, a rural community our size really wouldn't attract this kind of development, but for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, Prince Edward County is in a very different place right now. And, and you certainly see that in the numbers. Amanda, the other question that probably was the most common asked was, uh, what's it going to do to my rates? We already pay really high rates. Um, Don alluded to why some of those rates are high because of the small number of um, uh, connections we have relative to a a community our size, given our distributed system. But uh, can you just talk a little bit about the impact of all of this and our, and our, our current thinking and what that means to rates going forward and, and, um, and sort of how you see that working? Well, at this time, we don't have a finite figure on the impact uh, to the rate payers. Uh, this is just the beginning of this conversation. Staff are currently working with Watson and Associates on both the DC background study and the water, current water wastewater, the new water wastewater rate study. Uh, as soon as we have more information, and it's available, it'll be up uh, on our website uh, along with the frequently asked questions section. Um, I urge everyone to keep checking our website as we work through each of these items. And we'll be doing public consultation, which will give everybody an opportunity to uh, have their say as we move uh, through the right scenarios. Literally have your say, that's the name. Literally. Was that a plant? Did Mark tell you to say that? Um, so uh, just remember from the slides that um, uh, Amanda went through, you saw that the um, uh, we're targeting kind of a June timeframe to bring a, a conversation to council on, uh, on some rate scenarios and what the options are. And, uh, and we're getting um, some great uh, economist help from Watson to do that work. Um, Peter, I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, We got a lot of really technical questions, so I don't expect you to kind of go through all the details right now, but a lot of technical questions around um, the assumptions that go into the design for what it, uh, what full build out looks like and and, uh, where that um, $68 million number came from and and sort of the consulting work behind it. And I know that your team led that work, but with the help of consultants. So could you maybe just speak to the scope of what we asked the consultants to do? I know that was a a public process. It went through several public meetings, but just refresh for people's memory. What was the scope of that? And and what's the sort of timeframe or next steps on that work? Yeah, and I, in that you're talking about the master servicing plan. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so master servicing plan um, looked at the in, in the entire settlement area of, of Wellington, and of course, yeah, this is the master servicing plan for Wellington. It identified the existing system. It also identified future development and growth needs. Uh, one of the things that the master servicing plan does, it evaluates alternative solutions and then selects a preferred solution. One of the, uh, there, there was two scenarios that we wanted to look at. One was the full build out. Now the full build out um, was, there was no year associated with it. Uh, the settlement area in Wellington is, is a pretty good size. And so while the consultant did evaluate a full build out area and that price sticker that came in somewhere around a hundred million. We're aware that um, that's a number of decades down the horizon. We are more concerned about um, the, the more short term or immediate needs. So moving out from what the MSP um, gave us some information on and on the, on, on the selected 
and preferred solutions, we then focus more on what does this look like in the next 10 to 20 years? So that's where the $68 million uh, price tag came from. So we looked at a number of, of things that need to happen in order to, in order to accommodate the growth that we know is underway uh, for the applications that we have. So the new water tower was one of the items. The size of it was dependent upon do we full build out obviously would be a much bigger water tower or a second water tower. Uh, we don't need that size of a water tower today and we didn't need it for um, the next, we'll call it the, the, you know, the growth that we're going to be seeing here in the next 5, 10, 20 years. But we needed a size, we needed to draw a line somewhere. So we looked at, um, we looked at what, the, what the 20 year would look like, 20 year growth and, and sized a, um, an elevated water tank uh, in, in accordance with that. The other item was as a water main trunk. So when we think about flows and pressures and whatnot in, in a system, the existing plant and the existing water tower in Wellington was never really designed originally to accommodate new FQS or fire underwriter surveys type, type fire protection. Um, it can't, even by virtue of the elevation of the, of the existing tower, can't give you that. And it's not sized appropriately for um, a major a major fire. Um, a couple of years ago, or several years ago now, when Midtown burnt down, um, they they were, were very close to running out of water, and they would have had to put the plants in the bypass and suck water directly from the lake to put out that fire, which would have meant the entire little village would have been on uh, uh, boil advisory for for a period of time while we were able to you'd have to flush and superchlorinate and do a lot of things in order to get that system back up. So you don't want to be in that situation. Um, again, those, those, the plant and the, and the tower was never designed with those considerations. So you know we have to we have to bring ourselves up to to modern uh, day standards and uh, try to try to meet FUS where we can. In order to do that, you know, uh, a water main trunk line has to be has to be put in to help, help try to feed the system better. The existing Distribution network has a, has a difficult time if we put a tower at one end, has a very difficult time um, getting enough pressure and flow out to the other end. So with a trunk line, um, it, it's like a, call it a, like a 401 for water, um, instead of using your, your city streets to get traffic through. It, it, allows, it allows the water to get through to, from one side to the plant, to the tower quickly, and then and allows that distribution to the network a lot better. Another one uh, was the sanitary trunk, and this was to accommodate, uh, that would be a, to accommodate growth because the existing sanitary in, in Main Street Wellington cannot take any, cannot take any more load. So um, that would be needed to accommodate any future growth, especially north of the trail. Um, as Don mentioned, during wet weather events, the plant has a hard time uh, keeping up because we know there's a fair bit of water that gets into the sanitary system. And this is not true to leaky pipes or anything like that. We, we, uh, we know there's no stormwater system in Wellington. Um, so we've accepted the fact that some water gets into that sanitary system. And how, how, do, we, how do we deal with that? Well, we put this equalization tank in. So it acts as a buffer between wet weather events where we see spikes in the flows. It can sit there in that buffer or a dampener or, um, called by other terms um, while the plant can do its thing and, and process the water and get it back out to uh, treated water back out to the lake. Um, the EQ tank is required regardless of growth or not. It's, a, it's an existing situation, but it also allows um, to free up some capacity if it is there, which will allow some growth. So these are the, these are the main three things that we need for the immediate term and more for the short term than we, we get into starting to plan for, the, for new plants. Um, and then if, ever, if anyone's wondering, the EQ tank will, will stay to serve the new plant. So we're calling that phase one of the, of the new plant. Um, so that's, that's basically it in a, 
little, not really a summary, Marcia, a little bit more of an, an elaborate uh, uh, story uh, that goes along with that. So the MSP looked at all that. The MSP is a, is a concept document, though it doesn't bind you to anything. It, it uses terms like preferred solutions. So the next step is to go do a full-blown design on any of the things that it's recommending. Um, the MSP by nature is a Schedule B through the environmental assessment process. And uh, as such, anything that is a Schedule B qualifies as, as satisfying your EA requirements. But plants are, are, are a greater demand schedule. So we actually have to do a separate EA for the new plants, and which is one of the things we're undertaking this year, starting the EA um, for both plants this year and uh, getting to the point where we can get through that process and then start it in design after that EA is done. Thanks, Peter. So yeah, a lot of information there. So um, the master servicing plan, uh, some people would like to dive into the details on uh, the preferred solution and the information. I know maybe you could just speak to, I, th I believe we had, this uh, predates me, but I believe there was some public information um, centers and then uh, that has influenced and, and subsequent conversations within the municipality has influenced the final product. So we, um, when do we get the final, uh, the final product from that consultant phase in terms of what it is we're proposing so people who want to dig through the engineering can get to it. Yeah, so the EA process is a, is, a, is a public process. There were two PICs, which are public information centers, and uh, they, they were attended by, by area residents. And that's all documented. And things were, things were taken into consideration during those. And the consultant is producing a, what we're calling the final document uh, by the end of this month. So we'll have final, final EA document by, by end of April. So we'll be posting that uh, final document uh, on the website as part of the page that we're, we're starting to populate so that uh, people can uh, see that. And, uh, and as you say, Peter, there'll be more conversation as we get into the nitty gritty and the details of design of those two plants. Um, yeah, like uh, even as an example, sorry, Marcia, the no, go ahead. prime example in the, in the EA, in the MSP, Master Servicing Document, they, you know, the consultant was making a um, recommendation even on the type of treatment. Well, I mean, that, that is just, again, that's just a concept that's high level. Um, the actual type of treatment gets determined through the design phase. So even though at a very high level, this is what this consultant uh, deemed to be an appropriate treatment process type um, that actually doesn't get finalized and figured out in total until, until the design phase. So lots of opportunity for, for, for more comment and public engagement. So one of the other areas that is probably of big interest, uh, particularly to those in Wellington, uh, but uh, others interested in the in the price tag here and the the level of development. So those consultants who pulled together that master servicing plan that we're going to have finalized and uh, available for review at the end of this month, um, they base that on the secondary plan, uh, which is the the official plan land use planning document that frames growth in the future for um, Wellington. Can you maybe just speak to uh, how the secondary plan relates to the master servicing plan? Sure. So the secondary plan identified the settlement boundary. So the urban boundary settlement area, are all terms that we use here a fair bit here in the development services world. So the settlement boundary uh, or the settlement area, urban boundary uh, defined in the secondary plan um, as your growth area. And so that then, you know, regardless of the year, that, that's an area that is, has, been, has been targeted for, um, for growth. Um, there, are, there are certain areas there, you got there's residential, industrial. Um, so the MSP and this consultant um, looked and utilized that settlement area, which was defined in the secondary plan uh, you know, to base uh, what the growth needs would be for that settlement area. And again, as, as I mentioned, we, we scaled that back. It's, it's good to know what your total settlement area, full build out requirements are gonna be, but it's also good to know what your 
more important to know what you're going to need in the next 20 years. So it was like a two, like a two stage process. I think that's a really important point for everyone to understand because the, you know, we're working within um, a set of decisions that have already been made. So that secondary plan is not that old, but you know, maybe five years ago when people were starting to plan out what Wellington would look like, um, they didn't anticipate the kind of growth that we're seeing now. And, uh, and, you know, a secondary plan was a publicly approved document that has uh, allowed for a very considerable amount of land surrounding Wellington to become future residential or commercial uses. And uh, I think if you live or, or spend time in the village of Wellington, it's hard to imagine uh, a much larger um, version of Wellington, uh, but it certainly, that is a document that has been approved through a public process that sets that out. And now I think we're, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to service growth, what's realistic in terms of growth that might be happening in the Hi there. <laughs> uh, Mr. Clerk, am I still here? Everyone else is um, gone. Yes, you're still here. Okay. Uh, we had some technical right. difficulties there for a second. But that's okay. Uh, broadband is another meeting <laughs> soon to be scheduled. Um, <laughs> so I'm at home in my rural um, location, which apparently has intermediate um, service. So uh, I was just saying, so the secondary plan, we're, we're working with that uh, earlier decision. And then uh, it's fair to say, Dawn, that the, uh, the, the build out that we're talking about in terms of these new two plants, um, you know, you were talking about uh, investment required if we didn't uh, have any growth, but we clearly got a plan that foresees some growth. It's not, um, it, you don't want to build multiple versions of a plant, right? So we would have been, we would have been needing uh, some, if we we're kind of at a fork in the road, do we upgrade and, 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 you know, hang on to our existing facilities to build out in some future time frame, assuming nothing changes, or do we acknowledge growth happening and then we we look for a, a different kind of um, approach and, and thus the master servicing plan? Like, I just want to kind of have you comment a little bit on, um, from an operational perspective, uh, how you're seeing um, implementing this master servicing plan. Well, thanks, Marcia. I think, um if everything works out the way that it looks like it's going to, it, it, it seems like an, an opportunity. Uh, if we go with the no growth scenario, we end up uh, maintaining our old facilities, um, keeping them for uh, potentially 20 more years, spending $18 million. And then at the end of that 20 year period, we're gonna have to likely build two brand new facilities, 100% off of a rate based consideration. Whereas if we uh, you know, take advantage of this growth opportunity and uh, the benefit to existing works out to be 25 to 30%, whatever the, the particular DC study shows, then um, we're getting new facilities and only paying a, a portion of that, um, that aspect. So um, the current facilities uh, have a lot of challenges. And uh, to, to uh, grow um, with the existing facilities really isn't an option. And there were a lot of considerations during the MSP in terms of uh, the different, uh, different uh, suggestions from the consultant, uh, different aspects. But when it came down to it, it's very difficult to upgrade a facility, especially ones of this size, and do a major upgrade and keep the existing facility running. And that uh, logistics, those logistics that go along with that are very difficult 
So when it comes down to the age of the facilities, the existing equipment within them, the uh, potential for future costs that would be 100% borne by the rate base, it, it, the approach that was taken uh, from my perspective seems, uh, seems like a, 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 a bit of a win approach. Uh, obviously that comes down to uh, you know, everything working out according to plan. And, and I think we're optimistic that that'll be the case. But from an operations perspective, uh, I think getting new facilities within five years um, will balance out costs. We have potential for more users paying into the system, which you know, will hopefully stabilize rates. And, and uh, you know, these are all optimistic things, but I think uh, exciting stuff. There are no easy questions in Prince Edward County. That's what I've learned in the last year and a bit. Um, so Amanda, I'm gonna sort of pick up on that uh, in terms of the upfront uh, financing. We got a lot of questions uh, from people kind of curious what, what that means and, and you know what's getting decided maybe outside of the public eye and, um, and, and how we're, I think, fundamentally questions focused on you know, how do we know the municipality's interests are being protected? So can you maybe just talk a little bit about how we manage our risk and the, and the use of an upfront financing agreement? Because it's clearly not something Prince Edward County has ever tried before. Sure. Um, so this is brand new to the county. Um, under the Development Charges Act, so the, the first step is to get uh, an area specific DC adopted to allow us to enter into a front ending agreement. Um, the front ending agreement basically frames um, the conditions by which the developers will receive connections at what time in exchange for um, paying their development charges up front rather than um, cash flowing it through the phases of their development or when the, the building premise that building permits are issued. Um, to mitigate the risk, um, we uh, would be asking for a letter of credit, which I described earlier in my presentation, um, to help secure and mitigate the, the risk to the, to the municipality to ensure that those DCs are in fact paid up front. So it's an exchange between two parties, uh, both getting what they want <laughs> in the end. Yeah, and I think that um, uh, it's important to understand from a developer perspective, um, getting certainty about when they can connect is a, that's, uh, has a monetary value. It means they carry capital uh, debt on their side for less. Uh, they don't have to manage uncertainty, not knowing when things are going to happen. So they get the certainty of when they get to plug in the homes. And we get the certainty that if we're going to build all this infrastructure, they're actually going to be there to, to manage it. Um, Peter, we're also managing risk in the context of conditions as part of subdivision agreements, uh, correct? Do you want to maybe just highlight a little bit on how we, how we manage the risk that these projects really are getting built? I'm not sure I understand your question, Marcia, in terms of, yeah, there's always conditions in, in subdivision agreements. Um, we take securities um, for, uh, we talked earlier about pre-servicing, so I don't want to confuse people. Pre-servicing is something that a uh, developer can do totally on their own uh, with, with our approval, obviously, um, but there's no commitment from the municipality. As soon as you enter in a subdivision agreement, it is an agreement with the municipality and if something goes uh, awry, then the municipality is on the hook to complete it, which is why we take securities. Under pre-servicing, there's no securities required because there's no, there's no commitment required. So a number of conditions can be added to the uh, to any agreement. Um, I'm not sure if um, I'm not sure, Marcia. You know what kind of conditions that you were talking about, but well, I'm just getting at the uh, how we tie the upfront servicing agreement into the planning approvals because we don't want them to get too far down that process without knowing that they're actually going to sign on to this upfront financing agreement. I see. So. Yeah, within within the subdivision agreement itself, uh, there'll be there'll be conditions in there that link to the front to the uh, front ending agreements. Um, so, you know, as, as as to what that looks like, I don't know that we've gotten to that point yet. But there will be a there'll be there, there will be a cross cross reference and a dependency between the two, so that you know they wouldn't necessarily have an approval without 
having a front ending agreement in place. So right now in the in the draft in the draft plans, there is a there is a condition in the draft plan approvals that speaks to that the developers shall enter into a front ending agreement uh, with municipality. So oh, um, also to kind of just explain to those who are watching the kind of the way this works and where council's role fits in is that uh, so a developer might have an interest in a piece of property and they want to uh, develop it and they bring forward a draft plan of subdivision. So here's the vision for what I want to do and they get that approved by council. Currently, we have two large projects that have been approved by council and there's at least one more uh, coming before council uh, shortly. Uh, so they come forward with their proposal. Here's what we want to do. If council supports it, uh, then that's when we would engage in a conversation about a development um, upfront financing agreement because right now council will approve uh, development, but it's always contingent on our ability to service it. If, if we can't run the pipes and get the infrastructure there, then uh, you know that development can't go forward. So they're always, it's kind of a conditional approval until you can service it. So we will be looking to enter into these agreements so that we're not just um, suggesting that we're going to service it, but we're also getting some confidence back that they're going to help us um, guarantee that they are going to move forward on their project and not just generally we're going to move forward, but we're going to do X number of units over um, this year, next year, the year after. And so what's their pace? How do we plan for that? And then how does that relate to the way we um, manage our finances and uh, any uh, debt charges as were outlined in that um, Wellington slide. So, so there's a, um, uh, you know, uh, you're going to see some of this in the report that comes to council uh, on April 29th when we talk about um, a DC bylaw, trying to finalize a DC bylaw and background study, the area specific one that would relate to Wellington. Uh, that's what, as Amanda said, that's what's going to facilitate upfront financing agreements. And that uh, came before council in December, and it's been part of the conversation for a little while now. And uh, we will be outlining as staff in that report to council how we see um, upfront financing working in terms of how we would leverage this uh, agreement and, and move forward. Um, that kind of... Uh, relates at least in my brain to uh, another question we got Amanda um, which you know is relevant to Wellington but it's really relevant uh, larger as well and that's um, you know whether or not these cost sharing agreements uh, does that uh, how does that pay for costs like parks or roads or other services so we've been talking a lot about water wastewater um, can you talk a little bit about how these um, agreements with the developers in Wellington would relate to that other set of services outside of waterways? Sure. Um, under the current, well, the county has a current DC background study for services uh, such as uh, transportation services or roads, uh, fire uh, protection, uh, recreation, um, that we could enter into front any agreements under if there was substantial capital requirements uh, within any of those services. Um, to date, we've not done that historically in this municipality, but who knows what the future will bring. Um, outside of that, we use the tax levy to raise money to put uh, funds to reserves to use uh, to fund our capital plans right now. Uh, that with a mixture of um, uh, the use of development charges out of that reserve fund. Uh, we also um, utilize debt in certain circumstances to help finance capital in the other areas. Yeah, I think it's worth emphasizing that the, uh, the whole idea of upfront financing, it's very um, unique to Prince Edward County, but it's not unique to other municipalities. It's just um, it really only works when you have a very strong developer interest who are uh, uh, fighting amongst each other for allocation of a finite amount of connections and, uh, and, and that they really care about when it's not like I'm going to build it sometime in the future, uh, but I want to build it on a particular time frame and I need those, that guarantee. And that's what becomes the carrot for why the developer would be interested in the first place. So 
you know, it probably uh, is not very common in a municipality our size, but I don't think it's very common for a municipality our size to have um, the kind of uh, tourism and residential growth interest that uh, that the uh, county is experiencing and, and certainly probably not something anybody would have anticipated say a decade ago. Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, we got a couple of people asked us questions uh, about uh, the council's uh, commitment to a climate change emergency and how um, any of this development uh, and infrastructure servicing would, uh, could relate to climate change. Basically, what are we doing to um, make good on the climate change emergency uh, statement? I'm gonna ask both Peter and Don to answer this question, but um, maybe I'll start with you, Don. Um, how, how does any of this uh, possibly relate to uh, either adaptation or mitigation, mitigation of climate risk? Um, thanks, Marcia. From, from my perspective, maybe I'll make a little reference to the past. Uh, and even though this was before uh, the climate change emergency came out, uh, it, it goes back to 2011, 2010, when the Picton wastewater treatment plant was being designed. So generally, um, once we hire a consultant and we get into the design phase, um, there are a number of recommendations that can come out. And um, once you get into the, uh, the, the design process or, or the RFP or whatever, and I'm sure Peter can elaborate on this a lot more than me, but um, for example, in Picton at the wastewater plant, there were a number of uh, climate related, uh, environmentally friendly type of uh, considerations put into that design. So uh, things like solar panels and uh, turbines and heat recovery systems, um, as it happens, the uh, Pickton wastewater plant put in mowers that were extremely efficient that cut hydro costs uh, significantly. Um, so I would expect that uh, um, in these new designs, um, engineering firms are, are quite uh, commonly looking at climate related alternatives. Um, maybe also speak to Wellington right now in, in the next few weeks we'll be uh, bringing online our new uh, ozone disinfection system. And the plan is uh, eventually that that system would turn into a technology that would rotate into these new designs and may even end up having uh, water treatment alternatives uh, versus chlorine as primary disinfection. But um, our ozone system that's gonna be going in Wellington into the existing plant is being put in place to, as a green alternative to uh, save trucks travel, transport trucks traveling up and down the roads delivering chlor liquid chlorine. Uh, it uses hydro uh, at, at a, a fairly uh, efficient uh, cost compared to the, uh, that of liquid, uh, liquid alternatives, dechlorination and chlorination. And uh, you know, it, it, uh, the byproduct is uh, oxygen in the water. So we're not having all those trace chemical compounds that we're adding in things that contribute to uh, trihalomethane and some things like that. So um, I, I'd expect that consultants are going to be uh, um, uh, looking into those types of alternatives. And I think uh, maybe Peter can speak to it better than I can in terms of how the uh, proposal works and how we specify those requirements. Uh, Peter, do you want to jump in there? Well, sure, I can. Um, going back to your original question about um, climate change and whatnot, I was just thinking of a few things as, as we continue to, to focus growth in the settlement areas, uh, we reduce the overall, say, human footprint of it all rather than this sprawl. So, you know, just think in terms of rural versus urban development. In a rural setting, you're getting a well. We all know that there is um, sometimes inadequate water supply in the aquifers and, and, and the different water, you know, groundwater in, in, in Prince Edward County. Um, every, every single house in the rural has a septic system. Um, if you focus your growth more in the settlement areas, you have uh, less reliance on vehicles. People can walk to and from, notwithstanding that, you know, there may be some requirement uh, to, to increase some commercial in order to make that more possible in some of the areas. Um, but I guess, you know, just less land per person is required. And overall, I think that would have a, you know, you know a, a better effect on 
on overall the climate change. So maybe just to, and to finish up where, where Don left off, certainly when we get into um, terms of references for our, for our proposals, when we're going to do design, we can, we can specify things uh, where, where, it makes, where it makes sense to do it, um, including things like uh, solar panels and whatnot in terms of uh, the kind of green uh, items that we can put in into our facilities. So that can be built right into the terms of reference. We can do it as a um, as a as a must do, or we can do it as a provisional cost. Let us see what it's going to cost, and let it see let us see if it if it's feasible for us to do it. And you know, even if the even if the energy savings aren't necessarily there, then you fundamentally ask yourself, is it the right thing to do in order to satisfy the requirement? Yeah, that's a really good point, Peter. So the um, you know we don't have to have all the answers on. <clears throat> excuse me, what's the most climate resilient way to design a wastewater plant? We can put that into the request to, for the consultants to bring forward their ideas and innovation and the sector is certainly um, aware of best practices, but ultimately it's going to have a cost. So this is where it goes back to a council decision. Um, you know, sometimes a, a climate resilient initiative will save us money. It's more efficient. It's more effective. Uh, other times it's a premium, but it's, as you say, uh, a cost we might want to bear, um, all things considered, because of its uh, longer term uh, benefit for the community. And uh, it reminds me of the conversation council was having um, with the environmental advisory committee chair last week where uh, environmental advisory committee is, uh, you know, was talking about their strategic objectives and one of them was um, providing some more guidance to council around what, what do we need to do, what's the, um, the things that would make sense for a community our size as uh, smart steps to move us forward on the climate change commitment, what does that look like? And there's um, well over um, 100, 200 municipalities uh, across Ontario um, involved uh, and, and across Canada um, involved in, in different initiatives uh, through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and others. And we're certainly gonna pursue that conversation, I think, to sort of help all of us figure out what, um, what does that look like? But um, whenever you're building something, you always, it, creates a new opportunity, it's a lot harder to, um, to in institute those new ideas in a retrofit or in a day-to-day -day operation. It's not impossible, but it's uh, a lot harder. I, I think you'd agree. Um, uh, Amanda, I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, we got some uh, questions from a financial perspective. Interesting, um, people concerned, at least um, one person in particular concerned about post-COVID. Um, I love that somebody could write the words post COVID because uh, I'm not mentally there yet. But, um, you know, when we think about, you know, the pandemic, we're all going to get to the other side of it eventually. You know, what's the situation? The question was uh, around what's the situation of our um, municipal financial health? And really, there's a lot of money being talked about in all of this. Like, are we equipped to, um, to be that partner um, with these developers and, and still look out for the best interests of our community. What, what, can you maybe answer that question about our uh, fiscal health given the pandemic? Certainly. Um, the municipality has been impacted financially um, by COVID-19, there's no doubt. Uh, this was seen primarily through the loss of revenues, uh, our operating revenues in, in, during 2020. Um, the loss in revenues was mitigated by uh, provincial funding received for safe restarts. So uh, overall, the municipality was made um, revenue neutral from that, if you will. Um, our cash flows were uh, strictly monitored uh, by both myself and the CAO to plan out our procurement in cases we deferred procurement and um, to tax installment due dates. Um, the municipality at no time had to uh, dip into their operating line of credit. Um, we maintained positive cash flows through the entirety of 2020. Um, you know, uh, I would say that uh, right now our financial position is strong. Uh, we don't have um, a lot of debt incurred as a municipality. We still have a lot of debt room at this time. That's not to say that we will in three or four years as we undertake a new long-term care facility uh, rec or building and uh, some other major capital infrastructure projects. But right now, from a debt perspective, we have a lot of capacity um, as of today. Uh, 
you know, uh, again, uh, the, with this year, with the, the continued lockdowns, we are still uh, meeting weekly on procurement. We're making decisions to push things off uh, where we can to a tax installment due date. Um, so, you know, specifically overall, looking at the county uh, corporate wide, I would say we're in a strong position. Um, but when you look at COVID-19 and water wastewater, I would say financially it wasn't directly impacted because those revenues were still there. Um, so from a financial perspective, uh, they were not impacted. But um, having stated that, there is very little in reserves for water wastewater, where in tax supported we have um, capital plans directly tied to, to certain reserves for uh, the replacement of fleet, um, for road construction uh, and some other capital plant fire um, equipment uh, are tied to reserves there. And those reserves are, are contributed to every year and are strong. Um, I think I alluded to the fact earlier in my presentation that our water wastewater uh, reserves and reserve funds were strongly depleted um, in previous years. And so the current 2017 rate study in effect uh, the rates were uh, projected to help increase our revenues uh, or reserves and reserve funds um, and had us debt servicing all of the capital so that we could build those reserves for future capital. So there is very little to draw from now. Um, so we will still need the, the next rate study to continue on that trend um, to utilize debt and a mixture of those reserves and to continue to build reserves. But overall, I would say that the municipality and the provincial government has helped um, keep this particular municipality um, COVID neutral, if you will, in terms of costs and revenue loss. So COVID didn't make it worse for us financially, but we still have a pretty large infrastructure bill across all of our asset classes. In we terms do, we of have a huge infrastructure deficit, no doubt about it. Yeah, so lots of work to be done. And uh, it's also fair to say, isn't it, Amanda, that the, um, the previous rate study uh, did not actually um, plan for the infrastructure that's required in Wellington uh, today. So um, it wasn't part of the uh, factoring in the kind of analysis that we need wasn't uh, expected, That's I guess. Correct. And the, the last we... rate study saw a lot of capital pushed out of the uh, the term or, or I guess the period that the rate study looks at to calculate the rates that uh, was pushed right off the plan. So it wasn't even factored in. So um, that is why we're, uh, we're in the predicament that, that we're in now and, and trying to work forward. Well, and as Don pointed out, we have high rates already. So uh, I can understand why those decisions would have been made to, to, to try and reduce the hit on how much rates were going up. But I think it is exactly why we're looking at alternative financing models and looking at things like uh, upfront financing, because we've got to find a different way to pay for it because the, the rate base just can't handle that pressure. And, uh, and you know, we, we as you saw from... Um, Don's plan, there's a lot of operational maintenance work um, that uh, will also pinch the capital plan for some of the smaller systems, uh, which we have to make sure we have room for. And, and I guess I would also add that debt is such a hot button for us because we're, we are regulated through the province that municipalities can only incur debt up to 25% of their own source revenues for debt repayment. So we're ever mindful of where we're at in relation to that 25% and what we can and can't do. So we're also looking at other measures there to help uh, mitigate our impact to that as well and to seek some relief from the province. Great, thanks. Um, Don, I'm going to uh, switch directions a bit. We got um, a question that was had nothing to do with Wellington, which was kind of interesting. Uh, and that was about Belleville. So some people may have uh, noticed some of the media attention and, and the reports that went to council about the water rates for Belleville. Um, and maybe you could just, uh, for those who uh, haven't been paying attention, uh, explain a little bit about the relationship we have with Belleville as it relates to the Rossmore system and and uh, the question specifically was why is Prince Edward County charged more than than it would be if we lived in um, uh, we were bulk buying as a user in Belleville. Well, I guess if I can just kind of uh, elaborate. Um, so 
typically when municipalities are, are have water agreements with other municipalities, they tend to last for a long period of time. And the uh, Belleville, Belleville Rossmore Fenwood agreement, uh, it it uh, it was a 20 year agreement. So it just happened that it uh, came up for expiry at the end of 2020. And uh, we are still uh, um, working with the uh, city of Belleville on, uh, on the next phases. But historically, uh, those uh, those rates would have been uh, negotiated between the, the, at that time, it would have been Ameliasburg. Um, it was pre-amalgamation, so it, it wasn't the county then. And uh, at the time that that original agreement, it, it's difficult to find historical information uh, going back that far, but it appears that uh, originally it was on operations um, and, and to some extent maintenance and the cost of the actual water per cubic meter. Um, in 2006, um, I would have expected a change in terms of uh, the cubic meter rate that we're actually billed. Um, because the rate was there right from the beginning, but the rate might have made sense if uh, the city of Belleville was driving across the Bay Bridge to Rossmore, operating the fire hydrants, doing all the sampling and testing and, and that stuff. And I assume that that's how this agreement originally started uh, soon after the infrastructure was actually put in place. Um, not exactly sure in 2006 why uh, that rate perhaps wasn't uh, negotiated to a lower rate because at that time, uh, oper uh, county operations took over uh, routine maintenance and operations of the system. And all the city of Belleville did was provide us with water through the pipe, so to speak. Um, so I do understand that previous uh, um, um, management and, and council, council people and, and mayors and uh, other CAOs did uh, attempt to uh, try and have that rate reduced, uh, but uh, Generally, um, it's Belleville really has the ability to charge how they would like. It's uh, they have the product, um, and uh, it's up to us to decide if uh, if we want to pay the cost. Now, working together as a team, uh, Director Carter, uh, Marcy, and myself, we've uh, we've done investigation into what what the rates are, uh, what our own rates are, what they charge their own people, and uh, um, we're working together to try and. Uh, come up with a, a more fair approach. Um, we don't, none of us believe that the, the current rates are fair. Um, so we're optimistic that uh, uh, we're gonna hear from the city soon and that uh, and we'll have a, a, you know, some type of a, uh, options from them uh, that we can come back and consider uh, because uh, it is true that we pay more for the water than we charge ourselves, our own customers and we have some of the highest rates uh, in the province uh, because of our, our, our customer base. So it isn't really fair for them to treat us any different. And, and we can compare, we, we also purchase water from Quinney West and uh, we have a much more fair agreement uh, from, from them in terms of their costs and it mimics what they charge their own customers in terms of the Quinney West agreement. So we're really optimistic uh, that we're gonna hear some, some good news and we'll hopefully be able to share that with people. Yeah, I, um, Belleville Council recently directed their staff to go back and uh, and basically give us a counter offer and uh, and we put some information on the table. Council supported our council supported the staff recommendation to ask for a different deal and uh, you know the fact that the agreement has expired opens up an, a door to to revisit this and I think uh, I hope everyone at home really sees this as. Uh, all of us trying to, you know, turn every rock over to find savings across all of our service lines um, to make sure that we're we're finding the most efficient and effective way to run a cost-effective business. Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm conscious we have about 15 minutes left. I don't know if I'll take that full time. There were a few generic questions that I thought maybe I'd try to field. Um, we got some questions about. Um, who decides? Um, uh, I think that was coming around uh, the fact that there was an uh, ad hoc wastewater, water wastewater committee that was formed the last time the rate study was done. Uh, we have the benefit of the work that was done at that time. Uh, we've engaged um, uh, Watson Consulting, the economists, very well respected in the field, who are helping us um, on this. And, and there's uh, 
I think a lot of information, the fact we wanted to try upfront financing agreements and, and our engaging legal counsel to support us with that as well, um, you know, really didn't uh, see the need to, um, to bring another committee together. Uh, and, uh, and I think this, uh, our approach really was trying to have a, um, a wider transparent conversation because it isn't just about the rates and how much you pay for water. It's about the growth, how it's changing this community, uh, what's the right way to handle this, how do we pay for it, how does that relate to the infrastructure deficit that we were just talking about and we're just talking about water wastewater here tonight but we could easily uh, have this conversation in the roads space and will be with Council uh, shortly. So, um, so really, um, that the decision rests with Council, and, uh, and we feel that bringing this forward in pieces will be able to get that direction from Council and, and, uh, and, um, and provide some good advice to Council uh, for those decisions. Uh, another uh, bunch of questions were around kind of where is the opportunity for the public to provide input. Um, Peter mentioned the public information sessions that took place over the last few years as it relates to the master servicing plan in Wellington. Um, we certainly will have more engagement uh, countywide on the rates, water uh, and wastewater rates that are gonna um, be discussed. And in the presentation, we talked about that happening after we go to council with some uh, scenarios, some options on what this would look like. And then we'll do some consultation uh, through the summer and into the fall to give people lots of time to um, absorb it and provide feedback. So there'll be some opportunities for everyone to have their say. Uh, and, uh, and we'll look at you know, what makes sense in terms of different ways to engage people. Um, there's also the opportunity uh, uh, you know, at council meetings, at committee of whole meetings, as these uh, pieces come forward to have that conversation. And and staff are certainly willing to answer questions. Um, and if there are um, particular things that people are interested in, we're gonna try and populate our website to become a one-stop shop for those who wanna deep dive and really crunch the numbers and look through the technical and, and those who wanna kind of have a more higher level uh, view. So if you're not finding what you're looking for, do let us know. Uh, you can call customer service or reach out to any of us and we can um, try to get the right information that sort of hits that right note for people to make sure you're feeling informed and um, and can really see the, the checks and balances we're trying to put in place in terms of the options and recommendations we're gonna bring forward to council. Um, and then lastly, the uh, question I got, and maybe it was uh, meant a little um, tongue in cheek, or maybe it was an honest question. It's hard to tell from an email, but uh, a question around whether or not we have the capacity, uh, the, the adequately trained staff, I believe was the phrase, in order to pull this off. And I, I just wanted to end on that one because I'm incredibly proud of the team that we have here at the county. Um, you've got some uh, three very smart directors who are all extremely capable in their uh, respective fields who are having um, cross divisional, cross department conversations that uh, I think is fair to say have not occurred in the county um, in some time maybe ever. And, uh, and that's really exciting because uh, the world we live in today requires integrated solutions and you really need to not look at things through you know, a single lens. You really need to think about the related impacts. So you can't plan you know, your, your next 20 years of capital investment without thinking about whether or not um, uh, people are uh, moving in the community, moving out, whether there'll be new connections, uh, new people, new um, growth or not, you need to see those things together. You can't plan for, you know, how you're going to pay for something without understanding the assumptions um, uh, behind it. And if we're going to try innovative uh, ways to finance, you need to know the safeguards are in place, uh, not just on the financial side, but all the way through the, the planning and development process to make sure that we protect the interests of the municipality. So um, we don't have all the answers. We're trying things that have never been done before, but we're leveraging uh, smart teams of, of uh, people in our groups. And we are also leveraging um, strong consulting and legal advice where we need that assistance to sort of buttress it and, um, and, and develop it out. So uh, I, I do believe that uh, we are uh, in a really uh, strong position going forward. And yes, there are some tough decisions for the council to make. And this is, you know, it'd be much easier if we didn't have to do anything and we could just uh, coast the way we were, but um, the, the community is changing and 
Uh, we need to make sure we do that in a way that protects what's authentic and great about Prince Edward County. It was probably the single biggest reason I was interested in taking this job because I feel like the county is really at a, at a point in time where every decision really matters uh, in terms of the future and where we're heading. And, and I really believe that um, this team of people and the staff behind them are, uh, have uh, a real deep love of this place and a strong understanding of uh, the work that it's gonna take um, to try these things and, and move forward in a responsible um, and, uh, and uh, innovative where it makes sense kind of way. So taking manageable risks is really what we're trying to do. Ultimately, it's for council to decide and hopefully you've found today's uh, conversation or tonight's conversation helpful in, in sort of the getting the big picture. Lots of stuff was sent, uh, sort of thrown at you. Um, as I said, you can watch this all again, um, maybe with popcorn next time. Um, at your leisure, it'll be up on the website and please share with others. Uh, we're gonna put some more of the documents we talked about as they become available on that site. And uh, the slide deck that was shared tonight will also uh, be part of that conversation. And, and this is the beginning of um, a bigger, longer conversation of like some really important decisions uh, for council and for this community. And so um, I really wanna thank um, uh, the three directors, Amanda, Don, and Peter for taking the time and uh, putting yourselves out there. I know this is not what we normally do on a, on a regular basis, but you've all um, stepped up admirably and I really appreciate that. And I think uh, being transparent and open with the public, um, you know, makes you a target, but it also I think makes for better decisions. And uh, to the counselors who are uh, listening, I hope you found this useful and, uh, and aids in your context uh, to support the decision-making. I know you'll ask, a uh, whole bunch of hard questions that we're going to have to answer in the room and not with the benefit of having read them in advance. Uh, so uh, I know you'll keep us on our toes. And to the residents who took the time to uh, to donate uh, part of your midweek to uh, a conversation about our future, I, uh, I really appreciate the time you're taking and the, and the thoughtfulness for those who uh, wrote in and provided us detailed questions. That was very helpful in framing both the material we gave you and, and hopefully some of the conversation that followed. So uh, with that, I'm going to um, bring the meeting to a close and thank everyone for their participation. And uh, uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, I believe you uh, take over. Yes, um, so this is it. Um, thank you everyone. And I'm going to end the meeting right now. Have a safe Let's drive. Zoom wave, Zoom wave. Yeah. come on guys. Stay safe everyone. Take care.